Get started with the uh, the next session. Um, Professor Brian is going to give a talk on um, student engagement. Good morning, everyone. Oh no! Oh no! Just uh, some news briefs. Apparently, somebody important is coming today from Towardsville. So I would avoid that area at all costs later today. I hear our hands pushing our buttons, so stay tuned to what's going on with that. It's going to be a big tornado outbreak out west today, so I'm big into tornadoes, so I'm probably going to be glued to the weather channel to see if there are, in fact, some long track tornadoes. But one of the most important news updates of today is if you are a Game of Thrones fan and you missed the final episode, the dude in the wheelchair becomes king, the little guy is his right hand, the dragon queen is dead, and Jon Snow has been exiled to someplace cold and miserable. I didn't see the end yet. I know, so I, you don't need to. I told you, it really wasn't. I expected so much more after being drugged into watching it by my life. So I'm doing engaging students preceptorship, and as any of you that have had me in the past know that we just can't jump into a lecture, can we? How do these lectures have to start? A music video. Absolutely. And the music video has to pertain to what the topic of the day is. Disney? That's not the happiest place on earth. It's 150 It is. I was actually scoping that out.
Teacher, teacher, that's what it's about today. Teacher, teacher. Well, about two weeks ago, Dr. Boyer came up to me and said, Dude, you come to the preceptor conference? Dude, I don't know. I have kids. I have to find somebody to watch. Uh, is there, I'd like you to do a presentation on engaging students. You're very intimidating back there like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you have some like objectives? You know, what, what do you want to cover? Think in your mind, mind what the heck's engaging? What is engaging? And I started to run it through my mind and are we getting married? Am I learning how to drive a stick shift? Or am I Rodney Dangerfield going back to school? So, Looking up the meaning of engaging, this is one of many definitions of engaging that you will find if you research what it means. But basically, engaging means that you want to get the students excited and motivated about learning. For us, that shouldn't be too tough of a job, right? We are working with students that want to become paramedics. It's not like we're an English comp teacher having a student write a paper on the Great Gatsby about the symbolism in that book. I want to be a paramedic. I don't care about the symbolism in Great Gatsby. or teaching any number of the other prereq courses where maybe a lot of students are saying, how does this pertain to me wanting to be a paramedic? You're lucky to get these students that are there solely to become a paramedic. It shouldn't be that hard to get them engaged. But there are some things that we as preceptors can do to sour the taste in students' mouths for learning, to cause them to become disengaged in the learning process. Go and get on my soapbox, because all too often in the classroom, I hear the students say this. They come in, you ask them in my daily morning talks, how was your shift? And we get talking about calls. They'll say, did you do this or this? And they'll say, you know what? The preceptors say, some of them, not all of them. That's not how we do it in the field. And you know what my common response is? Every time a student says to me that a preceptor said to them, that's not how we do it in the field. I say, well, I guess that we should change the national EMS and uh, education standards then. Because if that's the right way, why the heck are we teaching them this way? Obviously, their way is better because that's not how we do it in the field. Please stop saying that. The students are taught according to the national EMS ed standards that have been developed by a bunch of gurus like the sergeant of arms who left, who have been doing this a very long time. Their educational 
educational standards. We teach them in the classroom. They are a prescribed set of rules and standards that the students are held originally to. to. And you, as preceptors, should be reinforcing those standards in the field. Let me give you some examples of this. We talk about medications and rate of push and how certain medications are pushed slow, certain medications are pushed fast. Students come back from a field rotation, they're like, yeah, they didn't push that over two minutes, they just slammed it in. Why the heck are you telling us we have to spend two minutes of our life pushing it in? They never did an assessment in the field, hands-on, lungs, belly. I call it the complementary assessment. Dr. Boyer has some fancy secondary assessment name. The staff never do a physical assessment. They ask some questions, they treat, they take them to the hospital. I say, let me ask you this, what do they write in their chart? Well, they write lungs clear, after solve down tender, don't be up to people with Oh, how do they do it? They force by documentation then, right? They didn't do an assessment, but they sure as heck documented one. Nobody scrubs the hub in the field when they give a medication. Why? Is there an alcohol shortage? Do they just not have time? I don't know. But that's not how they do it in the field. Folks, that's how they're taught to do it. They're taught according to a standard. A standard that you as a preceptor in the field need to be holding these, these students to. So basically, every time a preceptor says to a student, that's not how we do it in the field, you are helping to effectively tear down the foundation of sound treatment and assessment that we are trying to instill in these students' brains. If you are ever around somebody that you hear say that, or you and yourself, you yourself has gotten into the habit of saying that, please stop. Please pull your coworkers aside and say, that's not cool, don't do that. It's not helping when you say, that's not how we do it in the field. Hopefully the things they are doing in the field are the things that they are learning in the classroom and carrying over. Rest assured, over time, just like myself, they will develop bad habits. Bad habits probably each and every one of you have developed over time in the field. But don't start them off early with bad habits. Hold them to the national ed standards that they are being taught. So as I said, they're, they're trained according to a rigid standard. And your job as a preceptor is to hold them to that standard. How do you do that? You yourself as a preceptor has to continuously be a student. If you forget the sequential steps of doing a skill, bring up the skill sheet that is available to you in the online material through the paramedic program. Review those skill sheets. Hold the students to those standards when they perform those skills. Something that we just started doing is, I, um, I know in the past that students have come in and talked about calls and they see they talk, you know, an example would be, you know, I, I ran a diabetic patient the other day. 
And the preceptor failed me because I didn't know how to treat the diabetic patient at the ALS level. I said, why did they fail you? We didn't even get to endocrinology yet. We haven't even covered that topic. How can they hold you to a standard that you yourself haven't even obtained in the classroom? In the Plato site, the parenthetic site, where you used to go to do your online um, evaluations, there is course content there. And what we just started doing is I have published the schedule for the class of 2019, the PMP 134, the Airway Assessment and Intro to uh, Paramedicine, basically, schedule. So you will be able to access the schedule as they're learning the material, know where they should be in the program. We also hope to uh, upload the PowerPoints that we are utilizing to teach them that content matter. You need to, as a preceptor, stay abreast of where the students are currently in their training so that you know what to hold them accountable for. We can't be holding people accountable for advanced life support skills they haven't learned yet. Certainly all the BLS skills should be on the table because they come into the program as an EMT, but not the advanced life support skills. So when we talk about preceptor, this was derived from some articles uh, I found, and really it, uh, Dr. Boyer handed out a uh, thing that I copied for you all. It has to do with the one-minute preceptor, and I think it is a great model to follow when it comes to engaging and precepting our students. The one minute preceptor follows five micro skills and it's designed to get students engaged in learning. If you look at that pamphlet, basically the one minute preceptor, when you are faced with a patient situation and either during the call or during the post call, it's designed for you to help better evaluate or the student's abilities and evaluate the student's knowledge. In a nutshell, the one that preceptor begins with uh, you asking the student, so what do you think was wrong with the patient? You can do this during the call as well. In fact, you should be during the call and after the call. What do you think's going on with the patient? And they'll say, Okay, well, I think the patient's having an acute coronary syndrome. And the next micro skill as part of the one minute preceptor is to say, okay, why do you think this patient is having an acute coronary syndrome? And they should provide for you the justification of why they feel that way. Then you basically want to let them know what they are doing right or what they did right as far as management of that patient. You know, I think you did a really good job assessing that patient and since the complaint was from the nose to the navel, you threw down quick. You got that 12 lead on. You identified ST elevation. You got an IV quick. You realized the need for oxygen if it was indicated, and nitroglycerin, and aspirin. And you considered narcotics to help make that pain a little more tolerable. And you did a good job with the IV. And then whatever corrections you need to make in their actions. Even though you did all that, remember, time is important. In these patients, you don't want to immediately sit in the bench seat and grab the transfer care form and ask 50 questions. We should probably get moving to the hospital a little sooner. 
And then the final part of that one minute preceptor is teach the general rule. Now, what does that mean, teach the general rule? Well, with every patient presentation, there is a pearl of knowledge that goes with that. Let's go back to our example of acute coronary syndrome. You know, you identified that your patient was having an inferior wall in mind because you had ST elevation 2-3 ABF. Remember, part of inferior MI is to always consider the potential for extension of that MI into the right side of the heart, which could result in preload issues and could be a problem when you're giving nitrates. So you should always remember to do a right side at 12 lead in these patients with inferior MI. That is a pearl, that is a general knowledge. In almost every conceivable fact or every conceivable field diagnosis that a student gives you, there should be a pearl of knowledge that you can offer to them. What do you think was wrong? I think it was a stroke. Okay, well remember in stroke, it, it's important to be able to get your BSG, get moving off the scene and give notification to the ER. What do you think was wrong? What do you mean what was wrong? It was a severe trauma patient. Okay, remember time management trauma patient is important. You can't fix them in the field. We need to be off scene in 10 minutes or sooner. Those are pearls, pearls that you can dig into the vaults of your mind and bring up for potentially every field diagnosis. So that is a one minute preceptor approach to dealing with students. What do you think was wrong? Why do you feel that way? You did an excellent job with this, but there are these things you could improve on. And in the future, remember that every stroke patient, these are things you should keep in mind, or every MI patient, these are things that you really need to keep in mind. So there are some phases when we're dealing with students that we have these students. There are the pre-shift phase, the patient care phase, the debriefing phase, and the post-shift phase. And Dr. Boyer already sort of stole my thunder in talking about the pre-shift phase. Now, before we get to that, some of you may look back and think about some of the preceptors that you have encountered. What was the first impression that you ever had about a specific preceptor. How many of you have had the preceptors where you came in for that very first shift, never had them in your life? And they come in, look like they just rolled out of bed, really gruff, grabbed a cup of coffee, didn't even acknowledge you were there, maybe three hours into the shift didn't acknowledge you were there, and when they did acknowledge you were there, look at you and say, shouldn't you be doing a truck check? And continue to drink their coffee. How engaging is that? At helping get a student motivated about learning. You have about five or 10 seconds to make a good impression with somebody. And that first impression is long lasting. If you are one of those preceptors that you don't make that good first impression, the student walks in, you smile, you welcome them, you know their name because you looked at the schedule. Tell them to sit down, start discussions about the day. Let them know that you are interested in their education. If you don't do that, it's going to be a rocky road with that student from there on out. And it's going to sour the taste in that student's mouth 
about working with you in the future and potentially even going to that clinical site in the future. Had a person over the past couple of years that was uh, potentially a candidate to get a paid internship position at one of the local clinical sites. And they almost turned that down, that sure thing, because of the interaction they had with one preceptor at that site. One preceptor in their gruff approach to educating that student about turned that student away from that clinical site. A very good student, very knowledgeable student, would have really been a loss for a clinical site that is in need of employees, all because of one preceptor. That is the power that you have. If you don't want to be a preceptor, don't be a preceptor. But if you accept the responsibility, be a good preceptor. Be a great preceptor. So this is the thunder that Dr. Boyer sold for me. There is the pre-shift phase that that student comes in. You make a great first impression. You are happy. You are showing that you want to be involved in that learning experience. You want to make him or her a quality paramedic. You engage in conversation. You lay out the expectations for the day. This is your time to say, Jill, where are you in your training right now? What do you hope to accomplish during the shift today? What are your objectives? Is there anything you need help with? Okay. And these are my expectations. You're in your internship now, so you've learned all the psychomotor and the cognitive content. So I basically am going to stand back and I am going to let you do your thing. I'm not going to get involved. I am a ghost. You have a competent EMT partner and you know what that EMT partner can do. So you should be delegating tasks to them 12 lead or hooking up the monitor, doing vital signs, getting BSGs, helping set up your line. And I'm going to sit back and watch. If you need me, I'm there, but I'm not going to get involved. Do you understand that? I am setting the expectation for that day shift. Then there comes the station duties and the truck checks. How do we engage students during that time? Dr. Boyer already told you that you should accompany the student during their truck check, take that time to quiz them and ask them questions about medications if they've gone through pharmacology about the IV pumps, about the ventilators, if they've learned about those, about the BLS equipment, if they are only starting out as EMTs. Use that opportunity to quiz your students. And then station chores. It's okay to get students involved in station chores, but not too long ago, I heard somebody say, yes, we're getting students. I have somebody to wash the truck, take out the garbage, clean the urinal. My favorite station chore. I make sure I sign up on the shifts where the urinal cleaning takes place. They are not there to be your slaves. They are not there to do the station duties that you are getting paid to do. It's okay if you want to enlist their help, but you do it side by side. 
You don't go back up in the lounge or wherever and drink your cup of coffee where your student's down there scrubbing the toilet, checking the truck. To return an hour later while you're enjoying your second episode of your favorite show on Netflix. Catching up on the Game of Thrones finale that you missed. How did everything look? Oh, good, I know this is the stuff I need. Okay, here's the keys. Go get it. So our pre-shift phase, being actively involved. Any questions on that? Then we get a call. The tone's the wall. Now it's the big moment. For you as a preceptor, this is one of the most stressful times. Why? Because it is a balancing act between taking care of a patient and make sure they don't die and watching a student and making sure they don't die or kill somebody else. Hopefully, some of that is mitigated in that morning conversation. These are the expectations I have. So when they get that first, second, third call of the day, they know exactly what the expectations are. And during the course of events of that call, you revert back to your mind and you said, there was that nut at that preceptor conference that said something about a one-minute preceptor. And we learned five important micro skills. What do you think's wrong? Why do you think that is? Hey, you did a great job getting that assessment done. And that I need really good technique, but remember, I'm sure that when you learn it in the field, start low, work high. We gotta go to the intercube with a 22 gauge every time because it's a sure thing. And remember, in the future, when we have those patients, these are the important things to know. We're enlisting that one minute preceptor model during that patient interaction. And sometimes one other thing, it's a lot of things that drive me nuts. Maybe it's old, maybe it's because I'm old, but if I'm getting nuts, see now, there are a lot of things that drive me nuts. What drives me nuts is that priest that are the preceptors that think that their way is the only way. Now, to some extent, the hard skills, the skill sheet is the only way. That is the way per the National Ed standards. But if you're going to Pittsburgh, the ocean, there's a lot of routes you can take to get you to the same location. Just because you have done something your way throughout your entire career doesn't mean it's the only way. If a student is doing something that is their way, but it's not going to harm the patient and it doesn't go against the national ed standards, then why not let them do it? 